Wow, wasn't that just exquisite music uh, this morning from Jan and Julie and Lorraine? Wow. Um, we are now near the end of our series on Moses, that reluctant prophet, uh, the one tasked by Yahweh, uh, the creator of the ends of the earth, to live out a mission, to go and to free God's people out of slavery in Egypt. And we've kind of gone, try to see these parallels between the life of Moses and Jesus, how both kind of mediated between God's uh, perfection with our human brokenness. We both see how uh, they were prophets kind of helping to uh, reveal God's will into our lives. And in Moses' case, he was born a Hebrew child, uh, destined really for destruction, and yet he was plucked out of that, uh, educated, uh, and raised as an Egyptian. He had that identity crisis. Am I Egyptian? Am I a Hebrew? And he then kind of lashed out against that uh, Egyptian slave master, killed him, and as a result became a fugitive, went to the land of Midian. Uh, there uh, he had an encounter uh, dressed at a moment when he thought his life was probably over. He had no purpose, no function, a stranger in a strange land. Yet God chose Moses and really tasked him, uh, revealed to Moses in that burning bush, and gave him the divine name, Yahweh, I am who I am. And uh, I am is sending you to the Pharaoh to let my people go. I've heard their cry. And I've released them from captivity. And so Moses goes back to Egypt. They have that big kind of uh, confrontation with the Pharaoh. And we talked about how at a bigger level, it's really between Yahweh and the, uh, the idols, the gods of the Egypt. And subsequently, uh, Yahweh uh, is, prevails and the people are released. Yet Pharaoh has that change of heart and tries to track them down in the desert. And yet through a miracle, powerful miracle, the parting of the Reed Sea, that the uh, Israelite, the people were released uh, out of that kind of barrier. And as a result, they defeated uh, the Egyptian chariots. The Egyptians were the most powerful nation, or army in the world and took them down. They proceeded then to go, as you may recall, uh, to the mountain where Yahweh revealed himself to uh, Moses. Uh, there at Sinai, and there they encamped for the better part of a year. And to sustain them as they're going to a Sinai, uh, they get this kind of mysterious substance raining down from heaven uh, called manna, or what in the heck is this? What is it? That's manna. And it nourished them, gave them enough uh, to sustain on the journey, and provide to them in this encampment. Moses is up on the mountain. He gets the laws and the commands of God. And he also gets instructions on how to build a tabernacle. Meanwhile, the people are down, and as people often do, they complain and they grumble. And what you begin to see is this new theme that's kind of emerging in the latter part of Exodus and then through part of Numbers about the people who have been tasked with a mission. They're going to the promised land. God's going to bless them so that they can be a blessing. And instead, they're not focused on the mission. They're focused on the menu. <laughs> and they're hungry. And as a result, on their way up, uh, this desolate region between Mount Sinai and the southern Sinai Peninsula, they traverse up, heading towards the promised land, and they spend the next about 38 years in uh, a spring, a series of spring called Kadesh, Kadesh Barnea. And at that, it sustained them, but they also began to grumble and complain. And they did not trust that God would provide their means. Uh, Mert met, read for us the account of how they felt that the people in the promised land were too big, too numerous, too scary. They couldn't beat them. <laughs> and they grumble. That's the theme of numbers, is grumbling. Well, I want to read, I want to actually go back, not the passage. There's a whole bunch of grumbling going on 
in Numbers. I'm going to read uh, uh, an account in chapter 11, actually, verses 4 and 6. The rabble among them, I love that word, rabble, uh, had a strong craving, and the Israelites also wept again and said, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we used to eat in Egypt for nothing. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, the garlic. You're all getting hungry, Father's Day dinner. Um, but now our strength is dried up, and there's nothing at all but this manna to look at. Skipping ahead later in the chapter. Then the wind went out from the Lord, and it brought in quails from the sea, and it let them fall beside the camp. About a day's journey on this side and a day's journey on the other side. All around the camp, about two cubits on the, deep on the ground. And so the people worked all day and night, and all the next day, gathering the quails. And least anyone gathered were ten homers, and they spread them out to themselves all around the camp. Friends, this is God's word for God's people. Let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and meditations of each of our hearts, I pray they're going to be found loving and acceptable in your sight. Lord, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Do you know there's one common theme that links students going to a university with soldiers out in the middle of a field to the sick people in a hospital to the seniors at a retirement center? There's one common theme. Why demographic? They all gripe about the food. Universal. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was talking to my dad, uh, and he's over at Copeland Oaks, and, and, and it's nice. I mean, it's really, they go down for this meal, and they come, and a server comes, and you have a choice of different entrees, and a different side dish, and a different salad. They even bring you dessert. They bring it to your table. It's like, can I sign up for this? This is like awesome. But my daddy was sharing a story about how one of their table mates, um, uh, they had chosen steak. I mean, they had steak at this place. They brought the steak to the table, and one of the table mates, they didn't like the sauce that was on top of it, quite finicky, and they pushed it aside. They wouldn't even taste it, didn't even try it. They had already turned their nose up to this steak. Well, meanwhile, the steak just sits, and uh, finally, my dad says, hey, um, you interested in that steak? He got, a pl he got a take home and then had it for lunch the next day. A steak! This lady's turning her nose up to a steak. I've been to every hospital in the area, Cleveland, Akron, I've been all over. And I don't care where I'm at, there's one common refrain. They all can't stand the food. Students, here's the big change. I mean, I have a very distinct memory. When I went off to university, you would go to the cafeteria line. You would grab said plastic tray. You would go through the line. And you had maybe your choice of two entrees. And if you didn't like either, you could have pizza or maybe a burger. And they would plop it on your plate and on you would go. And that was your cafeteria experience. Oh no, not today. All of the students today, as they go on these university trips, they take you and they have a wide variety of options that you can go to Italian. They will bring you a fresh, hot oven-baked pizza right out of the oven that you can tailor to your own specifications. Oh, and if you um, uh, like Chinese, they have Chinese. Oh, deli, there's a deli. Uh, the vegans, they have a vegan bar. Uh, even for our friends like Jared, who have, yogurt, or have gluten intolerance, they even have that. I mean, it's just amazing the variety of what our young people today have in the different universities and what do they all complain about? The food! They're griping. I mean, soldiers. It, you know, it was just 100 years ago uh, when the World War I people went off. I mean, you were lucky to have hardtack and beef jerky. Okay, maybe throw a pack of cigarettes in, and that was pretty much what you got. Well, they kind of increased the mat. They had K rations. Any World War II vets, you know, it had K rations. Oh no, today, uh, even you're in the middle of Afghanistan, they have the MREs. 
Now, the MRE meals ready to eat. Now, of course, the soldiers have given it other kind of names, but it's MREs, and they have, you can have meatball marinara in the middle of Afghanistan. You can have uh, fettuccine Alfredo. You can have a wide variety of MREs, and yet they all gripe about the food, especially when you're on the move and when you're far from home. And, you know, I can connect at some level with that. I remember uh, it was about 12 years ago. Uh, my friend Dan Brozovic here, uh, he invited me. Uh, he goes with a bunch of scouts. I mean, they're Eagle Scouts. They're really good. And they go up uh, uh, canoeing in Algonquin. And I'm a tenderfoot. You know, I'm pretty, I'm not a, you know, a big scout or things like that. But uh, I always like an adventure. And certainly I love uh, seeing the loons and the uh, moose and all that. So Brian, come on up. So I go. And uh, we're gone for, what, seven days up in Algonquin. We're portaging our canoe. And before we go, they have the menu. And they bring, well, we're going to do a lot of trail mix. And so they bring the trail mix. Well, friends, I want you to know, I can't stand raisins. I can't. I hate raisins. And so they threw the raisins in the trail mix. And what am I doing? I'm going around. I start picking through the trail mix. You know, I love the walnuts and I love the M&Ms and all the other stuff. I can't stand the raisins. So I'm picking through it. And finally, they look at me and say, Brian, you can't pick. Eat it. Okay. So eat it. And then I learned a whole new word, I, a something. A, a new word uh, that you know, serve your meal and you scrape, you eat everything. They're, these are hardcore scouts. Leave no trace. You pack everything in, you leave no trace behind. And so, I, you know, and I thought I'd just throw out my milk, you know, or whatever, or my, my extra stuff. No. No, you consume everything. And uh, things you don't even like. Now, I had a remarkable time. I had a lovely time. I love seeing the moose in the Milky Way and the loons at night. It was great. But I can't tell you how grateful I was to come home to a home-cooked meal. What do we gripe about, friends? What's on the menu? Well, the Israelites are no different. Here they have seen, really, you think about it. They have seen remarkable things. They've seen the parting of the Red Sea. They have seen uh, how they've been released out of slavery in Egypt. They've been sustained all throughout the wilderness by this mysterious substance on the ground called manna. And yet, what we see the refrain over and over again are the people are griping. Uh, God's given them a mission. They're to go to the promised land. And instead, they are fixated on the menu. And after all these, you know, manna, they're getting tired of it. And they want meat to eat. And they start to kind of yearn for their old days when they had the flesh pots of Egypt and they had the onions and the garlic and the cucumbers. And, oh, I want to go back because they've lost sight of what God's purpose is in their existence. They are to go to the promised land to be a blessing to the nations. And they've lost sight of that. And they're complaining, they want to go back. And then they begin to direct their anger upon Moses. Now, see, here's the thing. Uh, there's a word that the Bible uses called rabble. I like that word. Uh, and the rabble, the riffraff, they start kind of griping to one another. Have you ever noticed, if you ever want to form an affinity group, all you got to do is complain about something, and you get people to flock around you. They love, people love to complain, and they love to have others complain along with them. They're directing their energy towards inwardly instead of directing it and calling out to God for care. And in the midst of their complaining, which becomes quite contagious amongst the people, they're starting to bicker, starting to complain, and they direct it then towards Moses. Well, Moses, instead of going to God for help, he gets angry at God. <laughs> and uh, instead of getting angry with the people who are complaining and contagious, he gets angry at God. And we get to this point in the book of Numbers where finally Moses is kind of at the end of his rope. He's tired of all these people griping about what's on the menu and finally says, God, I'm done. 
just kill me now. No, he didn't really say that, but you get that context in Numbers that it's almost like I, I, I'm in despair. And it's, I think it's a precisely this section where I think we can draw in some applications in our daily lives because we all will hit the wall, friends, at some point. And when we hit that wall, uh, we can often lose sight of the bigger picture. We fixate on the challenge that is before us, whatever that may be, health challenge, relational challenge, whatever, instead of trusting in God's provision and God's grace and mercy to carry us through these particular seasons. And I think in, in Numbers chapter 11, you, you begin to see that in those precise moments, God has two particular kind of um, uh, pouring out of his breath, his spirit. The first pouring out is this. The instruction to Moses is that you need to identify and equip others to come alongside you and to help share the burden. So pick out 70 amongst the Hebrew people that they can help uh, carry and be your kind of counsel and help care for the needs of the people. That's the first thing. Uh, is you got to spread that responsibility. And so often time, when we're in the midst of challenges, we think that we're the only ones who can conquer that challenge. And I think what this passage reminds us is, is to make sure that we identify and equip others to share that burden as we move forward to the bigger mission that is ahead of us, of keeping God and God's will first and foremost in our mind. The second thing is, God does send a wind, a wind that brings in the quail. And, and the quail comes, and they have their meat. And, and this does happen throughout the Middle East, that sometimes you get these winds, and they bring in these big flocks of quail. But then, after a while, isn't it fascinating? Uh, the people are griping about the manna, right? The, the wafer-like substance. And then, so God sends them these big flocks of quail. And then what happens after a short period of time? They complain about the meat. <laughs> Isn't that just part and parcel of our human nature? That we always want something more spicy, a bigger variety. We always look at what others have and, and kind of fixate on what we don't have. And, and I think the grand lesson of the wilderness wandering that we read about is, friends, we've really got to trust that God is one who will provide God is the one who will sustain. And God will carry us even through these challenges. And instead of directing our energy at complaining and griping and just being negative, then instead, even in the midst of the challenge, to count that blessing and to fixate instead on what's God's bigger purpose going on here. Uh, even in the midst of the challenge, is God maybe teaching you something? Is God kind of forming you? Maybe you've hit a wall, you hit a wall, you hit a wall. And perhaps what that means is that God wants you to see new possibilities to go in a different direction. I, I'm telling you, friends, what I believe we learn in the wilderness wanderings is that God will nourish us. God will sustain us. God will provide us, maybe not in ways that we want or ways that perhaps we even expect, but exceedingly and abundantly more than we can ever ask or imagine. And that takes me really to this connection about what our faith in Jesus Christ does. And that's found, we read in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Paul writes, and now he's encouraging his congregation in Ephesus. Now to the one who by the power, power to work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than we can ask or imagine. And so my closing question, friends, is this. When we hit those challenges, when we tend to gripe and complain, uh, my question is, is your God just too small? Are you just kind of trying to put God in a box and limiting God's really great purposes and accomplishments in your life? Or instead, is God trying to do something amazing to establish through you? Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, 
all of us in this journey, we will come through wilderness wandering. We will hit walls where it seems like we can't take another step. And in the midst of that wilderness wandering, how it is our human struggle to gripe and to complain and to dwell on the negativity. Help us instead to see what the mission is that we have been blessed by you. Uh, and not blessed just to consume. We've been blessed to be a blessing to others. And Lord, in the midst of that journey, help us to see that you will take each one of us to that promised land, all to those who are faithful and trust in your great promises. We ask for your strength. It's in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I would encourage you to please uh, turn in your hymnal uh, to page number uh, 529. We're going to sing 529, How Firm a Foundation, 529. Let's stand and join us again. Just a couple of reminders. After all of our worship services, one of our prayer partners is back in the chapel located underneath the balcony. That perhaps you've had a need in your life that has risen this week. Just like a word of encouragement and strength and prayer, that ministry is available to you. Hope you'll take advantage of it. And as you depart, uh, underneath the overhang right up front, we have the studs for the Price family home that's going to be going up this week. 
I hope that all of you will stop by and just write your name, uh, maybe a wish for Angela, for Brian, as they begin the construction of this home and that our prayers are with them as they start this journey together as we partner with them to build the Habitat House. For our benediction, I just want to read uh, this uh, stanza out of the song we just sang. Lord, when through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, thy grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design, thy dross to consume, thy gold to refine. Lord, send us forth now from this place, equipped and strengthened to shine light, to offer your grace into a world that is so hungry and in need. Equip us to go into our schools, our homes, our workplace, and our community to shine your light. Pray these things in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.